Hello and welcome to OmniDog's Vault. I am OmniDog and today Taylor and I have uh, the privilege of interviewing Ram V. How are you, Ram V? Yeah, good. Um, you know, in, in the third month of lockdowns as, as well as can be expected, um, but but otherwise, you know, doing great. You, this you this is the second looking. major lockdown in London, right? Is that what it is? Uh, yes, and, and I think this one's lasted for like three months. So, um, no, actually, I think this is a third major lockdown. Oh. Uh, it's just the one that's lasted the longest. So, yeah. Has it seemed to uh, have a, a good effect? Uh, yes, the numbers are down. And, and in, in general, I think, I think uh, it's been constructive for, for people's well-being and health. Uh, in that regard, but uh, I also haven't, you know, seen the inside of a cafe, which is where I prefer working from uh, oh, okay. in, in three months. Yeah, <laughs> you'd rather work. We Taylor will be back. He he must yeah. have. Uh, he'll he'll be right back. But you you'd prefer to work in a cafe rather than in your home. Yeah, uh, unusually so. I tend to be almost twice as as productive when working from a cafe uh, as compared to working from home. You don't get distracted by people coming in and out. I stop. need it. I Oops. need I need the people coming in and out and yammering next to me so I can actively ignore all of that and focus on the work. If things are too quiet, then my brain just wants to distract itself. Um, yeah, it's strange and I, odd. <laughs> I think you might be the first creator we've interviewed who doesn't want to work in absolute silence because we've asked creators before, do you have any music on in the background or, you know, silence or what? And all of them seem to want to work in silence. Yeah, I, I put on music all the time. I go out, sit in a cafe and write uh, to the point where the first thing I do when I move to a new neighborhood is figure out what cafe I want to write in. And then eventually, like a year down the line, everyone who works in that cafe knows who I am and when I come in and what coffee I will have. So, Yeah. <laughs> Well, so I heard Chip Zdarsky actually looks up coffee shop sounds on YouTube, and he has that playing as he writes because he likes to have that same atmosphere <laughs> that you like to have. So you could at least try to do that if you want to. <laughs> probably. I mean, I probably play. I play. I play good music when I'm when I'm writing at home, and it helps. Um, I think it's less the sounds and just more the kind of incidental distraction being better than actively trying to distract myself when I'm working. You know. And has it, um, it's been three months. So do you feel it's affected your productivity that you have not been able to go out? Well, I mean, incidentally, this also happened to be the year um, that I said to the most number of, yes to the most number of things. So I've been busy and I, I couldn't afford to let my productivity go down. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is getting to that point where I'm like, okay, brain, one more script. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> um, I uh, I first uh, became aware of your writing uh, with this book, These Savage Shores. Yeah. <clears throat> which <laughs> I did a ma major reorganization, and I couldn't find your book like five minutes before this interview. And I'm like, this is my favorite book. Where the heck is right. it? And <laughs> Taylor knows my collection better than I do. He said, don't you have a vault? section in your collection i'm like oh yeah that's right and that's where it was i'm pretty much his memory so i had to let him know where it was. <laughs> good good i'm glad yeah, you found it. um but I, I was this the breakthrough do you i considered this uh and i i think maybe a number of other people considered it a the breakthrough book that got your name out there because it was such an impress impressive book with um, not only fabulous writing, but such amazing art and colors and such a great, interesting premise. Mm -hmm. um, do you also consider this your breakout book? It's a, it's a weird question to, to, to answer from a writer's perspective, because to me, like every book feels like a breakout book in one way or the other. Um, at 2016, I self-published my first graphic novel. It was called Black Mumba. And that was, in, in a lot of ways, my breakout book because 
without that one, the Savage Shores wouldn't have happened. Without that one, you know, Paradiso at Image wouldn't have happened. Without that one, uh, I wouldn't have had a shot at writing anything at DC. So I feel like that's the book that introduced me as a, as a serious writer to publishers. And The Savage Shores is the book that introduced me as a serious writer to readers, if you, okay. if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, there's, there's always multiple levels of breakthrough. Um, I feel like Blue and Green is probably the book that, that, pushed, that I've pushed myself artistically on uh, the most, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I feel like every every book is a, is a breakout book in, in one way or the other, but but certainly I think the Savage Shores up until this point is is my most widely read work so far outside of the outside of the DC Marvel stuff, yeah. And I think you got nominated for Best Graphic Novel on IGN for Blue and Green, right? Did you, is that correct? Yes, so we won Best graphic novel, uh, and and I won best writer for for Blue and Green uh, at IGN. Yeah. Oh wow! Congratulations. That's a big honor. That is. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah, and I really liked uh, Blue and Green a lot. Not you know not again not only for the great writing, but these lay panel layouts. Uh, yeah. Uh, he is he. Uh, your uh, when he uh, I think he was also your artist on Graffiti's Wall. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, do you and he have a special um, connection? I mean, look at some of these panels. <laughs> these are amazing. And the art is so different from Graffiti's Wall to yeah. Blue and Green. It doesn't even seem like the same exact person at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, incidentally, I was having this conversation with, with someone else uh, just a couple of days ago on a podcast. Uh, and they were like, do you, you know, how do you find these artists? And then do you like working with certain types of artists? And really, my only answer to that was I like, especially for creator-owned things, I like people who aren't already part of the mainstream industry. Uh, and so Anand an actually, he and I met years ago before we did Graffiti Wall, and he was a portrait artist in India. Uh, and he hadn't really done a lot of comics, even though he was, he was quite interested and he had read them. Uh, and I think what that does is makes it easier for me to collaborate with someone like that and go, okay, well, I know a little bit about laying out pages. Uh, and so I can help rather than it feeling like I'm intruding on someone who already has their sort of preset idea of how they want to do their own layouts. Uh, and so having that kind of collaborative malleability, if you will, helps in, in getting the kind of pages that you see out there because uh, a lot of those pages, yeah, uh, those are they're they're born out of me and him sitting on the phone and chatting and exchanging sketches. Uh, sometimes I've sent him thumbnails that had the layouts on there, and sometimes he'll come back and he'll be like, "I want to do this completely differently." So I think there's a benefit to to working with someone who isn't already sort of ingrained in the ways of making comics, if you will. Yeah, because this um, this is one of the things. Uh, as I said, that really was so attractive about this book it, uh, are the unusual layouts and the um, the sort of um, they're sort of lifelike, but they're also um, sort of sketched in lifelike in, yeah. in a different way than I've seen before with these brilliant colors and then uh, some really subtle coloring. But but the book. I mean, the book just seems to pop out every every different every page seems to be um, very affecting to the mood of the book. Yeah, yeah, that's something we wanted to do, um, especially considering, um, like I said before, pre-show we were talking. I love I love music as well. I love listening to music, uh, and I think there's some measure of crossover between the way you experience visuals and the way you experience emotions when you listen to music. Uh, and part of what we wanted to do with this book was have those two things kind of collide within the artwork itself. Uh, and so hopefully the, the, the visuals are evocative of, of jazz and music, you know, on a sunny afternoon or in a smoky club. Uh, and so and that was part of, that was part of the intent of doing that. The other thing we wanted to do with the, with the kind of sketchy realism that you mentioned is um, 
I think there's a very unique sensibility to the horror in that book where because you put something that feels so real in in the context of something that is so absurd like like you know spiral staircases with sunlight coming in from the windows or or the shot of a skull half buried in the ground but it's also very real because it's rendered in that sort of hyper realistic way and so that sort of putting the realism and the surrealism right next to each other has a kind of very disconcerting effect on, on reading the book, I think. Uh, and that was kind of the intent of what we were trying to do. Um, and considering Anand had been a portrait artist, I think this is a lot closer to the style that he actually works in than something like Gravity's Wall. Mm. Well, I'm sure I'm going to leave Taylor to ask you the jazz questions because Taylor's a big jazz aficionado. Right. And uh, I'll let, uh, go ahead, Taylor, ask him what is. Yeah. So as you're writing blue and green, it obviously comes from Miles Davis's blue and green. Mm -hmm. What, were there any specific albums you listened to over and over again as you were writing this book? I actually had a fairly detailed soundtrack that I, that I used. Uh, I think I even shared it on social media. Let me see if I can uh, oh. pull that up. But um, I'm, I'd be happy to send you guys a, a, a list that you can link to later. But yeah, there were definitely um, more than more than albums. There were uh, there were there were tracks that I listened to uh, repeatedly that that went with the music. There's a lot of Miles Davis, not just Blue and Green, but also like Round Midnight. Uh, there was in a sentimental mood, Duke Ellington. There was a lot of Bill Evans trio in there, uh, Lars Gulin and Wynton Marsalis. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really weird, uh, varied soundtrack. And I think the only commonality that all the songs in that, in that list have, um, is that they're bordering between being beautiful and sad versus being oddly haunting at times. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's kind of the the mood that we were trying to achieve with the book. Yeah, I think jazz is one of the most misunderstood genres of music. I think a lot of people view it as like background elevator music, but I think, it, like you said, it's the most emotional music that you can even listen to. And I love yeah. how you paid respect to this really important genre of music in this book. Yeah, I mean, I've, my experience with jazz uh, is, and music in general actually comes from my father, who's a, who's a sort of big music aficionado um, back back in India. He never played anything, but he encouraged me to play. So I played a lot of guitar and learned a lot of Indian classical instruments when I was a kid. Uh, but we would sit down in the evenings and turn off all the lights in the house and just put on music, just sit in complete darkness and listen to it. And that kind of blocking out everything else and listening to music was ingrained in me from, from, from childhood. Uh, and I think blues and jazz has been kind of present, ever present for me. Um, even when I when I had the idea for this book, it was from going to a, a jazz performance after Emerald City Comic Con that I'd, I'd been to. Uh, and I remember sitting there and having a drink with the bassist uh, while they took their break in between sets. Uh, and we talked about how jazz and writing are trying to do the same things in that you're taking conventional notes, but you're playing them in a way where you're trying to reach for something really complex. And that's only present when you arrange those notes in an unusual way. Uh, and I think writing tries to do the same thing. We're taking words and, and letters that we use every day, but we, we write and we present them in, in a way where you're trying to reach for something that is complex and that you can't articulate. Uh, when you write. Um, and so, with blue and green, the idea was to to sort of use that element, narrative element that's present in both arts. If you will. Hmm. Well, those evenings with your father are probably the reason why you have to have that background noise as you write, because you've kind of been trained to be in yeah. that environment with music. Yeah, yeah, no, I can't, I can't imagine you know going a day without listening to some kind of music. Um, I've, I've got something or the other on all the time, and also explains my obsession with writing comics that involve music in some way. Like I'm writing one, another one at Vault called Radio Apocalypse, which is about the last functioning radio station on the planet. 
um, yeah, it's just set in a post-apocalyptic universe and rather than focus on the post-apocalypse, we're focusing on these four guys who run a radio station out in the middle of nowhere uh, and, and struggle to sort of keep it running at the end times, if you will. Oh, that sounds really interesting. I'm a huge music fan uh, myself. <clears throat> Excuse me, jazz. I appreciate jazz. I don't, um, I don't love it as much as Taylor does, but I, I do appreciate it. But um, my, my father was always involved in radio stations as I was growing up. So I, that book sounds like it would be really interesting to me. Is, yeah, that, an, he, is that an independent work? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it will be out in April. And it's again with Anand who did Blue and Green and Graffiti's Wall. So um, Anand's my, my band member, if you will. So anytime we're making a comic about music, uh, I suppose he and Aditya, who did the lettering, are both involved. Yeah. Well, I, I love dynamic duos in comics, like an Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips, Mark Wade, Chris Somney. So it sounds like you guys kind of have that relationship. You always kind of do something together throughout the years. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a while back we discussed that, at least I, I, I told on him that, look, if you if you ever find yourself going like, okay, what should I do next? Just get in touch. I will always have a comic to a story to tell with you. So I think so far we've kind of just been jumping from project to project. So we might eventually need to take a break at some point. But um, yeah, I'd imagine you'll you'll be seeing a lot more work from us in the future. Anyway. And Radio mm -hmm. Apocalypse is that like a five six issue miniseries at Vault? Uh, well, it's it's four issues to begin with the first arc, and I have plans for three arcs. So oh, okay. So yeah. Usually, Vault's been doing more like standalone stuff, like miniseries. So yeah. this is, yeah. is this one of their first like ongoing type of titles? No, I think they've had you know wasted space and then the plot and stuff. They were, uh, those books were certainly ongoing. Um, they wanted they asked if I wanted to do the Savage Shores another volume, and I was like, no, I that story is ended, and it's hard to kind of. I think it weakens the first volume for me to go in and, and write another one after that uh and so we were discussing and they were like look pitch us something longer bigger as well and so i said okay well i have this thing that's probably 12 to 16 issues so here's the pitch and they said we love it bring it over so awesome. you obviously have a good relationship with them where they're asking you to pitch stuff yeah yeah i mean um Fortunately, everything I've, I've worked on so far, everything I've done in terms of comics work has, has been received well. And so uh, in general, I think all the publishers I've worked with have also been quite happy to go like, okay, Ram, what are you doing next? Um, and so, yeah, I'm in, a, I'm in a good place with publishers wanting to publish my work, which is, can't complain about. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It's a good problem to have too much work on your plate. Yeah. Um, can you can you talk at all about? Um, I know Taylor and I were talking about your DC work uh, mm -hmm. earlier today. Um, you've done uh, Catwoman. You're starting out Swamp Thing. Yeah. Um, you're doing a Future State. Uh, well, let's see. I I I ordered the Justice League Dark uh, trade from you, but it hasn't arrived yet. Right. Uh, I'm a big fan of Justice League Dark. Um, is, is there a Justice League Dark that you're working on for Future State also? Yes. So um, with Future State, the Justice League Dark story was part of the Future State Justice League book. Uh, okay. And so there was, a, there was a Future State Justice League story and a Future State Justice League Dark story in the same book. Okay. And that was that's the one that I haven't gotten yet then. That's uh, yeah, I mean, I imagine so, but it wasn't collected in trade. Oh, okay. uh, in trade would have in trade would have been the the ending arc to James Tynan's run, which is the one that I kind of joined in. I think okay. from issue twenty onwards. So so twenty to twenty eight is probably collected in in that last trade. Well, Taylor and I are collected editions fans. Um, right. I, I don't buy singles anymore, and right. so I don't. I'm always a year behind on everything, sure. but I keep up with the news. So I, I knew you were doing that. Um, yeah. So can you tell us, what can you tell us about uh, Future State 
um, and what it means to DC from a, a, a creator's standpoint? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to say what it means to DC, uh, okay. just, just because, you know, these opinions would be mine. Okay. Um, but I think, I think it does this. I think the intention behind doing future state outside of the, the functional elements was to give people a taster of what to expect in, in infinite frontier and, and March going forward. Um, but not do it in a way that feels like an insignificant break to just to give you a glimpse of what's coming. So instead of doing like a taster or a preview, what they did was they said, okay, let's go into the future, you know, two decades, maybe, maybe 50 years, maybe a hundred years into the future of your March run. And let's tell a story there. So readers can know, oh, this is what, everything is going to build towards um and you know to to what extent that stays true obviously things change as you're writing stories but at least with my stories because i'm also writing the ongoings for uh, swamp thing catwoman and justice league dark um the future state stories are extrapolations of where you will see events building to uh when when the ongoing start in march Okay, that was the best explanation I've heard of future states so far because I've been somewhat confused recently. <laughs> That's been really helpful to hear that. So I think, yeah, I think yeah. a lot of people kind of thought, oh, well, it's a shortened version of like the 5G initiative that they were planning on doing. And so it's kind of nice to hear. No, it's just no, a, I mean, I originally pitched the Swamp Thing ongoing as part of that 5G initiative. Uh, and so they're not going to shorten ongoing pitches to two issues. Uh, I think if uh, the future state is exactly as I explained, it's, it's a glimpse into the future of these books that are going to start in March. God, I think a lot of people will appreciate that explanation because <laughs> I know it's, a lot of people have been like, wait, what's, <laughs> I'm glad. Like, what is this, what is this actually <laughs> supposed to be leading towards? That's really helpful to understand. Yeah. So, and, and I, and, and I understand the, the kind of why there are so many versions of this explanation out because there's so many news websites just speculating on, what things are and what things were and the more sensational the take the more clicks but from a from a storytelling standpoint that was the brief when when they came to me and they said ram we want you to be part of this event called future state we're going to do two issues or three issues or four issues of of each of your books but we want you to do stories that are set in the future of where your books are when they start in march um and, and i think that's a pretty interesting and, and logical way of doing it. We should rename this Ram V explains future state. <laughs> Instead the of definitive it. explanation of future state. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm also one of those writers who's not very, um, at least as a reader, as a fan, I'm not too bothered with things like continuity and, and uh, like, I just like reading good stories. So, on some fundamental level, Future State is also just two issues of a good story. Go read it. It's fine. <laughs> well, it helps me to look forward to it more knowing that there is like that end goal of like, no, this is this yeah. this isn't just like a break, like you said. It's not just giving us right. a two month breather. It actually has a purpose. I think that's yeah, really yeah. helpful for and, me to hear. And a lot of people have asked me this, so it's probably good to clarify that as well. Like the team you saw in Future State Justice League Dark. That's the team you're going to see building in March. I'm not going to do a, here's a new team. We're going to have that team kind of build and characters will come in and some of them will drop off and some of them will turn on each other and all of that drama will ensue. Um, and same thing with, with books like Catwoman or Swamp Thing. The, the events that you saw play out in the Future State books, it will certainly be building to those events or or, or Pre echoes of those events that you'll see in, in, in the March runs. Yeah. And who are the characters on your Justice League Dark team? So it's a it's a complex question because as I said, um, one of my things that I did with this pitch was to say I don't want to keep like one team consistently through whatever twenty issues of a run. Rather than do that, I'm gonna have a, a core set of characters which is going to be uh, Zatanna, John, um, Detective Chimp, and Etrigan the Demon. Uh, John Constantine, Zatanna, Chimp, and Demon, yeah. 
And then we're going to have characters like Fate, like Xanadu, like Ragman, like, um, you know, I could, I, could, I could name more, but I'd be giving stuff away. But those characters are going to rotate in and out for, for two issues or three issues. Uh, and then, and then, you know, they may repeat, you may see fate in, in issue five, and then you may see him again in issue seven, eight, nine, and then you may see him again in issue 12, 13. Uh, and so we're going to have that sort of rotating cast member thing going on. Uh, and you'll also expect to see some unexpected characters playing roles in Justice League Dark stories. Like there, I know there's two issues with Batman in them, and there's, there's going to be a couple of issues with other unexpected Justice League characters in them. So I wanted to make the whole thing feel a lot bigger uh, rather than kind of constrained to four characters or five characters, if you will. As long as Zatan is in it, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's, uh, I mean, I hinted at this in Future State as well. So she's leading the team again, which is which is cool. Um, that is great. She's. I, li I like writing her, yeah. It kind of sounds like the dark version of Justice League Unlimited, the cartoon, where it's like you have those core characters, but you also explore like Booster Gold and those other random DC characters. So that sounds yeah, really yeah. interesting to me. And I, I like doing that because, like I said, when I was growing up in India, I didn't have Marvel DC comics. So I didn't grow up reading these comics. My introduction to the whole sort of DCU was the animated shows, like Batman animated series or, or Justice League animated show. Uh, and so those were my introductions to the DCU. And so my creative references go back to that. And I was, I'm was i always puzzled. I'm like, okay, well, there's 16 issues. You've had just the same team. We haven't seen anyone else step in. Let's do it. Let's bring in, let's bring in other characters. Well, that is a fresh take. And I bet it is really popular because it sounds so much more different than what we've had before. But... Taylor's right. It does sound like uh, the cartoons that you grew up on where there was a core and you brought in other yeah. members. Um, I'm just now starting to uh, get educated in the DC animated universe, courtesy right. of Taylor and another friend, another couple friends. Uh, so I'm, I'm starting to see uh, uh, the benefit of, of uh, <clears throat> getting that cartoon knowledge because a lot of it is really well written and really yeah. fun and i i had written them off because i'm so much older than uh i'm not when, when i say my peers i just mean my comic peers right i'm a solid 30 years older than taylor and everybody that grew up on these cartoons sure. just written them off as as cartoons and now that i'm discovering them uh there's a a, a wealth of fun and yeah really great stuff going on in them that I had never realized before. A lot of them are incredibly complex and, and nuanced and uh, really well written. And if you look at the people who made those cartoons, certainly certainly the, the Batman animated show, um, it was it was Bruce Timm and, and Darwin Cook. And you can see their work in comics. And it has the same depth and nuance, but it also has the same kind of we're just having fun. It's comics, guys. We don't have to be super serious all the time. And so I love that kind of joy to, to the stories uh, that they that they write. Uh, and hopefully, certainly with something like Justice League Dark, uh, I'm trying to do the same thing in that let's have some fun. Let's do some crazy stuff that we haven't seen in comics for a while. Uh, so yeah, there will be a lot of unexpected craziness going on with Justice League Dark. That's great. Is there any unexpected craziness with Catwoman? I swamp thing um, lends himself to unexpected craziness, but how about Yeah, I feel like I feel like all three books are playing to different sensibilities that that I'm very interested in. Like Justice League Dark is my place to go and just break the world. Like, okay, no problem. We're gonna go to six different realities in eight pages. I'll do that. Uh, Catwoman is my sandbox to do that kind of 80s, 90s Hollywood crime. Uh, and I really like that aesthetic. I grew up on those kind of summer action blockbuster movies. Mm. Uh, and so certainly my, my reference for Catwoman stories is that kind of an aesthetic. 
Like the first issue I did uh, was Catwoman Nine, actually, before the ongoing run. I'd done a I'd done a couple of one and two shots, uh, and Jamie Rich was my editor on on that. And he said, "Okay, pitch me a story idea, one shot. You get one issue." And my pitch literally said Catwoman comic, but via Steven Soderbergh. Uh, and so we we literally did an Ocean's Eleven Catwoman comic, uh, and if you if you go back and look at the issue, I'm pretty sure you can see the markers of that kind of slick casino heist movie playing out uh, through the issue. And I love the crime element of Selena Kyle. And my favorite run so far with Catwoman is Ed Brubaker's run, and he really leaned sure. hard into that. It sounds like you're really leaning into that '80s action movie crime yeah. movie kind of. Aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, my touchstone for, for Catwoman stories uh, is also that Ed Brubaker run. Um, I came into it via Darwin Cook more than Ed Brubaker because I didn't realize Darwin Cook was such a huge DC artist. Like, I hadn't read New Frontier. My first reading of Darwin Cook was the Parker uh, crime novels that he did uh, adapting um, the, the novels. Uh, and so I came into his DC work via that. Uh, and so reading Selena's big score, which is the Darwin Cook, Ed Brubaker storyline, that one to me it was the epitome of, of Catwoman stories in, in a lot of ways. We later learned to, to love you know, Miller's take on it and, and Tim Sale's uh, take on it as well. But um, when I came to writing this, I knew I wanted to do something in that style. Um, but I also didn't want to just repeat what Brubaker had done. Uh, and so I'm trying to lean more into, okay, let's take what he did, the successful elements of what he did, but also tie it into to Batman's world and the kind of big giant bombast of the Bat villains uh, leaking over into, into Selena's world, if you will. Does Batman make much of an appearance throughout your run, or will he make much of an appearance throughout upcoming issues? I, I don't think he makes an appearance throughout the run, um, partly because I think one of the challenges of writing Catwoman is for the book to feel like it deserves to stand on its own uh, and not not as a sort of oh, bat villain spinoff or, or bat ally spinoff, however you want to you position that. Um, and so I wanted to take some time to build Selena as a character that can stand on her own. Uh, but obviously her relationship with Batman and, and Bruce Wayne is such an important part of who she is as a character. So we'll have moments of crossover. We'll have one or two issues where Batman shows up. But I think the book will suffer if he's any more of a persistent presence than that. Yeah, I'd like to see a focus on just Selena as you're saying, this book sounds exciting to me too, especially, and I think Taylor probably too, um, because we both love the Ed Brubaker, Darwin Cook stuff uh, with Catwoman uh, and anything that is specifically solo Selena really appeals to me. Uh, I mean, I, I'm happy to read her with Bruce and or Batman, but I love reading solo stuff about yeah it. yeah and when you're when you're a writer and you're writing a catwoman book you want the book to be about catwoman and not about you know who she's involved with or who she's partnered with or who she's fighting crime with uh, and so i was very aware of that when we went in uh, and i think you know we've we've managed to do that successfully and now we're kind of pulling in elements of few of things you might not expect to see in a catwoman book like Poison Ivy is involved now, and then where's that going to lead? Or uh, we've had we've had the Riddler involved for a while, and you know eventually where's that going to lead? So, yeah, there's there's interesting threads to pull on there. If I have one request, it would be to bring Slam Bradley in the run because I love that character. <laughs> I love that character so much, and DC hasn't done anything with him, at least that I can think of recently. I would love to see someone do a Slam Bradley miniseries or something. That would be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed Slam in, in, in the same way uh, reading that run, um, but I also think Slam Bradley is, is very much a character of his time, 
uh, and and if you're if you're trying to push forward outside of outside of a few issues, if you suddenly have this kind of certainly 60s, 70s noir cop showing up in in you know 2020 comics, you're gonna have some kind of cognitive dissonance there. Um, so yeah, so I can certainly see Slam's presence as a character and then the book benefiting from it. But I don't know. I don't know if uh, if we want to take the whole book back to that sort of yeah. noir crime era uh, storytelling. Yeah. Just saying, if DC says, "Hey, what do you want to do next? Do you want to do a mini series? <laughs> Just say, "Hey, I'll do, yeah, I'll do Slam Bradley." Just saying. <laughs> oh, they've asked. I've pitched them some ideas, so we'll see where it goes. See Harley Quinn in everything. Sorry. I just want to see Harley Quinn in everything. That's well, every every everyone wants to see Harley Quinn in everything. I think <laughs> I think every book benefits from a random Harley Quinn appearance. Oh, that <laughs> to my ears. <laughs> I uh, that that is great because she is my all time favorite character. Um, what um, what can you tell us about uh, Swamp Thing? Then what can we look forward to there? So, so Swamp Thing is probably my more serious, more melancholy, more introspective writing book. And, and that one is particularly kind of close to my heart in a lot of ways because um, when, when I was asked what I wanted to pitch for, for DC, I was given an option of pitching for various characters. And I uh, pitched for Swamp Thing because I wanted to write a modern day Swamp Thing book that still did all of the things that I loved. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, my introduction to comics wasn't from when I was a kid, as I, as I said before. My sort of real introduction to comics happened after I'd moved to the States. I was studying to be a chemical engineer. A friend of mine gave me the first volume of Sandman. Um, and, and that really introduced me, to sort of gave me a second childhood with comics, if you will. Uh, and I kind of got into reading all the other mainstream stuff off of that Vertigo lineup. So Sandman, Hellblazer, Swamp Thing, all the Ennis, Ellis, Morrison stuff. Um, and so by the time I'd started writing comics, you know, Vertigo was already looking like it was on its last legs in some ways. Uh, and so to have the opportunity to take that character and execute it in a way that still feels true to the stuff I love, but also is part of the DC mainstream universe uh, is an interesting challenge. And, and, and I feel like I'm able to scratch my sort of literary horror itch with that book. Um, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people um, in, in terms of how it's executed, in terms of its tone and, and its maturity while still very much being a superhero book. Like issue two has a Batman appearance in it, but it's still going to feel very much like it's Swamp Thing, you know? Well, that happened in the original Alan Moore story where he went to Gotham. No. So that's yeah. always been a part of the character to some degree. Yeah, um, it, it has. And, and I feel like a lot of people look at it and, and go like, oh, well, it's a very literary take. No, I mean, he's got, like, literally has Martians talking like cartoon characters running around the pages. Uh, and then, you know, next issue, Swamp Thing's part of the body of an alien spaceship traveling through space. Like, it is very much comics. It's what's, it's just expansive. It's imaginative. And I think a lot, I think the comics would benefit from a large number of comics going back to being that kind of, let's dream again. Let's, let's. Nothing is too weird. Nothing is too strange to explore. Uh, it doesn't all have to become about interpersonal drama. There are still concepts and ideas that are big enough to explore in comics. Well, that's really exciting to hear because I, I'm not interested in the status quo anymore. I want new. I want fresh. I want original. So all the things you're saying about DC, I'm really excited about. because I don't want to see these characters grow stagnant. It sounds like you want to take them to new and interesting places. So I'm really excited about all these titles. Yeah, thank you. Like, I mean, I think that very much has to be part of your drive as a writer is like, okay, I'm, I'm being, you know, I have an opportunity to do a Swamp Thing series. Surely I don't want to write another 
series that tries to be Alan Moore, or that tries to be Dysart, or tries to be Brian K. Vaughn. I have to do something that is uniquely me, and so it has to be my voice going into the book. Uh, and so as long as, I suppose, as long as I stay true to that, we'll, we'll end up seeing new and interesting comics at the very least. Well, what, I agree with Taylor that it sounds exciting, especially for me as I've been a, a fan of comics for 55 years. And I, at this point, I'm a little jaded yeah. as to certain characters um, repeatedly getting the focus in certain books um, when I when I think there are opportunities for other characters to be explored. Um, cer certain characters <clears throat> on the DC side anyway, I think are, are just used way too much. And the idea that you're um, wanting to do a fresh take on these books is really exciting to this jaded comic book reader. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad. I think part of it has to do with that I didn't grow up reading these characters. So my childhood isn't embedded or linked with these characters uh, as much as, as a lot of people uh, are. And so I suppose one of my first meetings with, with a DC editor was like, how do you approach these as a fan? And I'm like, well, no, I don't approach my writing as a fan. I approach my writing as a writer and I approach my reading as a fan. Um, and so I think you have to be able to take interesting writing decisions when you're when you're working with these characters. Uh, and hopefully, you know, hopefully that's what we'll be seeing as the series goes on. And you can't break these characters. Like, I want to see writers take chances and know, okay, the next writer is going to change things. It's going to be different for the next run. So yeah. it's like these characters are so embedded within us, they can't be destroyed. So just go yeah. wild, go yeah, crazy. I think, I, I think the, 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 way, the way creators and readers think about these characters is very different from the way you know, corporation thinks about these characters. Um, I, like I've been, I've been on that side of the of the of the fence, if you will. Um, when I was a when I was a chemical engineer, I worked with a large corporation. And the thing you want to do is you want you want to avoid all risk. But that is that is antithetical to to creativity. Creativity, yeah, you're gonna fail a few times if you take risks, but your successes will be that much better for it. Uh, and I think, I think, part of part of my conversations with my editors is always that I always tell my editors, "Yeah, you, you need to let me write a bad issue every once in a while. It's okay. <laughs> like if I if I write a bad issue, it means I'm trying to do something interesting, as well. Uh, and so, you have to let me take that risk. If you if you don't let me take a risk, I'll always be writing a mediocre issue all the time. Hmm. Mm. And there. Yeah. And the big They're writers up. and directors, whenever they fail, they fail big. At least it's interesting yeah, when yeah. it fails. Yeah, it's I would, just I like, would much rather see flamboyant, brilliant catastrophe than <laughs> quiet failure. You know. <laughs> what? Uh, what? It, was there anything in particular that led you to DC than other publishers? Was it this the general list? I mean, I think I think like I said. Um, just because my gateway into comics was Vertigo, okay. mm -hmm. um, I think there was always that kind of closeness and, and an understanding of DC characters. But even so, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that there is some kind of inherent inclination towards DC characters. It's just that um, I'm I'm familiar with some of them because I've read them. But also, my first sort of intro to DC was handing my self-published book to Jamie Rich, who was a Vertigo editor at the time. And so I, I always tell this story, it's a funny story. He said, hey, Ram, do you wanna come do a Vertigo book that's like this? And you know, the new creator in me was like, oh my God, I'm gonna do a Vertigo book. I'm gonna do a book that I that, that got me, it's part of the label that got me into comics. Uh, and so we discussed this. And then a couple of weeks later, Jamie is like, listen, I'm no longer at Vertigo, so I can't push this book anymore. So unfortunately, we're going to have to put it aside. I was super disappointed. And then a week later, he emails me going like, well, I'm no longer at Vertigo because I'm editing the Batman group. So do you want to come write uh, a Batman story for me? Uh, which I did, and that was my first kind of introduction to DC. So 
my my gateway into DC happened entirely via Vertigo, just like my reading experience into DC did. And that was Secret Files? Yeah, yeah, I did a Batman short story in Secret Files, uh, and then I did a couple of Catwoman one-shots. Um, but yeah, so, so it's been largely a, a, a matter of happenstance uh, that, that I started but my work was seen by DC editors and they, and they picked it up. Um, you know, I've also done a couple of stories at Marvel, but uh, I'm also at a point now where I can't, I physically can't write more books. So maybe some, sometime in the future, we will, we will branch out to other publishers as well. Are there any Marvel characters you would just like glob onto and really want to write if you got the opportunity when you're a little less busy? So, Usually my answer to this is I'm more interested in in stories than characters per se. So like, which is, I think part of the reason why I'm not averse to just bringing back obscure characters, because like, look, I, I know you have this character. I have this interesting story to tell with that character. So I'm more interested in that. But the one exception to that rule, because I already have a story in my head is Dr. Strange. Uh, and I have, I have spoken to you know people at Marvel about it, saying that yeah, one day when that character is available, you give me a call. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I'd tell a pretty mean Doctor Strange story. <laughs> yeah, because any character can be interesting. I think we've seen that with some of the stuff Tom King's done, like with Vision or with Mister Miracle. It's like just throw any character at you as long as you let me do what I want. It, it, it I can mean, be but also also look at all the great comic book works right the things that we we go go to and we say oh this is amazing this is seminal work watchmen is seminal work swamp thing is seminal work uh you know the the daredevil miller run is seminal work it's because these creators came in and took what were very different characters at the time and told interesting very different stories with these characters that then shaped what the characters would become to the generation that read it after them. So um, I'm interested in doing that. I'm interested in taking a character and just doing like, a, here's a completely different take on this character that you haven't seen before. Well, I find that an exciting vision, a very exciting vision. Uh, rather <laughs> than more of the same, I would, I would much rather see uh, a third tier character made really interesting than another, you know, a level character just get another book written about them. That, yeah, me, I mean, for me, like that, even, even, I, I know that, that that is a categorization, but it doesn't even feature. Sometimes I will have really weird and obscure takes on a level characters that I imagine publishers will listen to those takes and just go, like, no, we're never doing that. But um, but yeah, I think it's in the nature of, of what I enjoy doing uh, is going like, I bet you've never thought of this character in this way. Yeah, well, I would love you your vision on a Superman book or something then too, if you're going to do something interesting and never before done, I would love to see that too. Yeah, one day, one day I'm sure, I'm sure that will that will come across my desk hopefully but right right now yeah as i said i'm, I'm just in a place where i'm like i've already said yes to too many things <laughs> well you have some great characters to work on so we're excited yeah. about all the stuff you're doing right now yeah, yeah. thank you uh taylor do you want to ask um our wrap-up questions yeah, so we usually do like lightning round questions at the end, like wrap, quick wrap up, uh, wrap up questions. You already asked about the one with music, so you got that one out of the way. Um, right. But I, we always want to hear from creators what they're excited about in the industry right now. Like what's a book that you just really love right now and you want more people to read? Something that you've really enjoyed recently that people should pick up. Um, I've been enjoying Department of Truth immensely, uh, which is James Tynan's uh, series at Image. Um, just because it seems to sink in so well with all the craziness going on in the world right now. Um, and so I've, I've been enjoying that tremendously. I enjoyed Little Bird uh, by, by Darcy, Darcy Van Polgeest, I think, um, and, and Ian Bertram. Uh, I thought that was 
really interesting, really good work as well. Uh, and yeah, the, I think those are those are a couple of things that I read recently that I really enjoyed. Uh, also enjoyed Once in Future, Kim Gillen, um, who's a good friend and an amazing writer as well. Yeah. Hmm. So as you can see from our backgrounds, we're big collectors. We have like collected editions. Jess has statues. We both have action figures. Is there anything that you collect? Um, books, I suppose. Uh, I collect a lot of books. I collect guitars as well, but uh, not as not as much of a, a collection as you guys have got going back there. <laughs> I have I have about four of them. I have an old 1975 American Highway Fender Strat. I have a black and gold. Gibson Les Paul sitting in the back there. Uh, and if I could turn my camera, but I can't, uh, but I've got a little library going on to my left, which is just full of books, uh, including comics, including art books, novels, all kinds of stuff. Um, one of my earliest memories is, is uh, my dad used to have a li library at, uh, back home and had some 400, 500 books in there. Uh, and so, one of the things that I've been working up to is is just building a library like that. Are there particular kind of novels that you're drawn to that you read more than others? Um, I have I have favorite authors, but I read kind of omnivorously, uh, so so I read everything. But um, Paul Auster, Murakami, um, Ali Smith to an extent, uh, and and the classic old school sci-fi stuff, Philip K. Dick, Frank Herbert, all, all those guys. So yeah, yeah, I have uh, Michael Shabon as well. So I have a few favorite authors here and there, um, but, uh, but I'll just, I'll pretty much read anything anyone recommends. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Where can our viewers find you on social media? Uh, you can find me at the right Ram on Twitter, which is, probably where I'm most active. I'm also there on, on Instagram as Ron B. Writes, but less active uh, there. And I'm present on all social media, but most probably inactive everywhere other than Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it. one day after we've actually been able to read Catwoman, Swamp Thing, Justice League Dark, we can have you back on again and talk about <laughs> even more stuff yeah. coming down the line. So once those yeah, yeah. come out, we get some, some of those pages under our belt. They should, be, they should be out soon. I have I have my advanced creator comps that are already home. So I imagine they will be in store shortly. Great. Well, I'll make sure to put your social media uh, tags in the description. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank, you for uh, thank you so much. It was uh, very exciting to talk to you about your your near future projects that we're going to be able to read really soon. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, I'm quite excited to, to have them out as well. All right. Well, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You've been uh, talking with Omnidog and Taylor interviewing Ram V. If you could please uh, leave us a like, uh, feel free to leave a comment and subscribe. We would appreciate it. And I know we're going to get comments especially Omnidog, why didn't you show, have him show his guitars? So that's going to be the main <laughs> comment. So thank you very much for tuning in to the audience, and thank you to our guest, Ram B. My pleasure.